G'day, and welcome to the AHDC podcast series, Health Design on the Go. I'm your host, David Cummins, and today we're speaking to Stuart Turk, who is a qualified critical care nurse. Stuart has been involved in clinical planning, nursing, and medical education program development and delivery across Australia for over 25 years. As a clinical health planner, Stuart is heavily involved with design development and delivery of health environments. Stuart is currently speaking around the world on his health and design experiences and how to improve human-centered design, which is why he's perfect today to speak about our human-centered design podcast series. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you for your time. Thanks for inviting me, David. Happy to be here. First question, what is human-centered design? So what we've done for quite a long time, and when I first started being interested in design, we looked at patient-centered design and models of care developed around patient-centered care. And what we did was we said, okay, we need to do these things, but to improve the patient experience, to make sure that we're more reactive, to ensure that patients got the best care at the right place at the right time. But we seem to have forgotten about the people who work in the building. We haven't thought about the nurses or the doctors that spend their time in the building or the people who provide the ancillary services, the cleaners, the environmental services people, porters, people like that. And it was highlighted during the pandemic. One of the big things that happened was the spread of COVID in actual hospitals wasn't so much from patient to patient. And I think Health Infrastructure in New South Wales presented a fantastic series on the way they found the spread of infection in hospitals was when staff went into staff rooms and removed their masks to eat their meals and then chatted amongst each other. The result of that, which really got a lot of friends who are still nursing, these people were forced to go and eat their meals in their cars or go to places outside of the hospital so that we could reduce that spread of infection. But what it really highlighted was the lack of spaces or amenity for those people to go to. And for me, I recently presented at the Salus for Healthy Cities, Healthy Living. And one of the things I was focusing on was, the other thing we forget about is that it's a stressful environment. We know that the burnout rate is increasing The other thing that we know from population data, and I think, I know this is not being put out today, but the United Nations released information during the week. And what it highlighted was that the population of the world, the amount of children is decreasing, the amount of aged people is increasing. So we've moved to this point where we've got so many people in the world, but because of the aging population, we're running out of people to do the jobs. And that's going to carry on for a few more years. And what we started looking at in our practice and that I started discussing with Mrs. Thomas quite a lot was how do we help hospitals? How do we help facilities? How do we help health organisations retain people and attract people? And we kept coming back to this, hospitals aren't just for patients. The hospitals are these places where people spend a lot of their time working. So I guess for me, human-centered design came from what happened with the pandemic, but also with the aging population and the impact that's going to have on the workforce. As a nurse myself, David, I've been with Silver Thomas Hanley for, this will be my third year now, but up until then I was working as a nurse and being a senior nurse, I was able to work for agencies And I didn't want to actually work in any one particular hospital, but I certainly had two or three hospitals that I loved working at. And the reason I loved working there was because the amenity was better. The access to an outdoor space or the access to a larger tea room or the access to a breakout area really significantly influenced whether I went back to a facility or not. So bringing that experience in and then trying to write about it was really difficult because Everyone wants to give everything to the patient. Patient got to have the biggest room, got to have the best ensuite, got to have this, got to have that. But the people delivering the care, they need a bit of love too, I guess. And and that's where I'm coming from. You're 100% right. We've all been on the design and the construction tables where you do give that more space directly to the patient, inevitably to help the staff as well, because you want more space and more working space. But I've also been on 
in the director's chair where the staff rooms are so small and there's no natural light and there's one fridge and you double up the staff room with the meeting room because you hit the requirements. And that need for outdoor space and natural ventilation, the research shows that how much it improves the patient care, but there's very little research to show how it improves nurses and staff in it and everyone. So what you're saying is 100% correct. It's just, I don't think many people put the two and two together recently. No, I agree. And I think one of the things when we go through planning, you've been through planning, and one of the things I notice is when it starts to get short on space, they're the spaces that get attacked first because everyone wants more storage. That comes up quite regular. Oh, I need more storage. We've got all this equipment. And it's like, okay, well, we'll just chop a bit off this staff room and we'll chop a bit off this breakout space or this meeting room. And exactly as you said, get to a point where people will go, oh, We'll put a petition wall, an operable wall, and we'll have that. And that can be between the meeting room and the staff room. And it just gets left open. It never becomes a meeting room. It just becomes that bigger staff room. And I don't have an issue with that. Don't put the operable wall in. Just say it's a big staff room. It's okay. Like, look after the people. So how does one argue budget versus human centered design? Obviously, patients bring in money, staff use money. You can't have one without the other, but it is way easier to argue a bigger space for a patient who needs three or four nurses for a transfer versus a bigger space for nurses needing a meeting room. I think your idea is, your principle in research is fantastic, but at the end of the day, it comes down to money. So how, how does one argue that point? Well, you could argue about money. You could say, oh, you know, the cost benefit. And so the first thing is how much does it cost to onboard someone? And if they hate the experience and they quit, and they're gone within a month, how much did you just burn? So there's one way you can argue money. I think the other thing is that it's not so much about the money side of it, David. The thing with that population change and with burnout, we're running out of people. It's something I keep saying, and and people really struggle with the concept. You can't open that bed for that patient if you don't have a staff member. And I think that, We're starting to see it now, but I actually think that's going to become a bigger problem because five years from now, but around 2030, we hit the absolute peak of this age change. So we hit this peak where people are all retiring. We never trained enough people to come through and replace them. The people that were retiring are going to need their joint replacements or some of them might have led sedentary lifestyles, so they're going to need their gallbladders out. So all these people are going to need care, but we don't have the people to care for them. So I think organisations have to think differently about investment. Capital investment isn't just about how much money I can make. You're dead right. It's about the quality of the service that I can deliver but also that attracting and retaining staff. Because my experience is I made more money as a casual. I could make a lot more money working as a casual nurse and picking and choosing than actually being a permanent staff member in a hospital. People always want that job security, right? I think for me, that's one thing. There's a certain group of people that want their job security and they're happy with where they work, but it's not enough people to sustain a whole organisation. One of the things I worry about is we're building these massive hospitals. We talked about this at our meeting with the Australian Health Facility Design Council, where we're saying we're going to build all these hospitals, but we're not going to have anyone to staff them. Yeah, I 100% agree. I feel that these ridiculously big budgets are coming out at the moment for certain facilities, and they sound good and they look good, but as some key people around Australia have said, We don't even have enough staff now to support our patients. So what are we going to do? And there are certain hospitals around Australia at the moment that are literally opening at 25, 30% capacity and brand new theatres are not being opened and operated because they do not have the staff. And part of that reason is because they don't actually have the staff to maintain, but also staff are going elsewhere where they can have outdoor facilities. They can enjoy the fact of where they're living or working most of their lives. So you're 100% right. What do we need to do as designers, as thinkers, as builders, as health professionals? What do we need to do to try and prioritise this more? Well, I think one of the things for me is, and I think you know yourself, we can go into a meeting and we can say, oh, you know, this is a concern, but it's organisations have to own this. Organisations themselves, if someone's 
considering a strategy to build a new hospital, they have to build in what they need for staff at day one and they have to stick to that vision. You and I can sit in a meeting and we can bang on the table and we can say, you've got to look after your staff, you've got to look after your staff. But at the end of the day, you know, exactly as you said, well, how am I going to get another theatre? How am I going to get X more beds? This is actually my brief from, could be the government, it could be from a private resource. This is what I've got to deliver. They need to be more strategic about how their workforce, how they have their workforce, how they treat their workforce, how they grow their workforce, because without them, they can't do anything. And We'll continue to sit in meetings. We interview for a lot of jobs that we do. So we'll go through a process, a tender process, and then we'll have an interview. And one of the things I talk about, and it's passionately because being at the front line, as you have in your previous roles, you've got to look after these people. Now, if you don't look after these people, they will not look after you. I remember a long, long time ago, I worked for an organisation who said, our greatest asset is our staff. And I think that needs to come back. That sort of thought needs to come back. Because once it comes back, those things you're talking about, the outdoor spaces, uh, access to air and light, that's where it comes through in the strategy and that's where the design is. For me, one of the things I find interesting and I love about my job is I get to work with some really creative people. I can describe something. So a lot of my work is briefing and I'll say, we need a tea room. The tea room needs to be able to hold X amount of people and it needs to provide this facility. But then as you're writing that brief, you're, no, I want natural light. I want access to natural air. I want people to be able to go outside. I want them to be actually able to choose their space. So when we design the space, instead of just doing a big open room, with half a dozen tables, you can have some booths, you can have some tables, you can have some benches, and people can choose their social experience for their meal time. It might be that you've had a really bad morning and you just want to go and sit in one of those booths and you want everyone to leave you alone. You might be having a great day and you want to sit down with everyone and have a big chat, or you might just want to sit there with a couple of friends that you're working closely with or colleagues and discuss, oh, geez, what are we going to do this afternoon? But actually giving people that choice. Yeah, we're actually doing a podcast series on landscape architecture and the importance of open spaces for patients and staff as well. And the people we've been speaking to have reported very minimal research in that space, even though everyone understands it. So consciously, when you experience it as a staff member and as a patient, what is the research in this field? Like, is there much research or is it very much just experience given, experience given your background at the moment? I think one of the things I've found really interesting is and a lot of places do post-occupancy evaluation. And I guess a lot of that comes down to how long it takes. So you know yourself, like whether it's a government or a private project, you're looking at probably a three-year, four-year process from start to finish. So one of the things I'm really keen to do is start doing post-occupancy evaluations on my projects. Now, the problem I've got is my very first project is still two years away of being completed but it would be good to go back in there and then do that survey experience how do you find this environment we could do research on this we could actually use agencies which hospitals are your popular hospitals and why and then go through that sort of process i think you're right i don't think there is a lot on this i think it's evolving and i really think the pandemic pressed it so I know I talk about the population and population data, and I know it does people's heads in, I get it. But we knew that we were going to have a problem. We knew that we were going to have a problem with staffing. In 2000, I saw someone speak from the Australian Bureau of Statistics at a rural nurses conference, and they were saying the problems that are going to be faced, not so much by the larger regional, but the smaller regional and rural communities because of the lack of people being trained and the aging population so he went through this whole thing and I walked away from it and I just thought to myself if we're not doing anything now if we're not increasing our nursing numbers now if we're not increasing our allied health numbers now if we're not increasing our medical numbers now how are we going to battle this and they kind of government after government we had changes and it doesn't matter who it is we've had multiple governments of either parties and they didn't really do much about it. What COVID did was accelerate it and at a great rate. So people I know that were nursing that were a bit older and were probably thinking of retiring five years from now, they all retired. 
And what actually happened was a whole bunch of experience and a whole bunch of knowledge walked out the door. Now, the things that we're starting to see come in, the Rusong, these are undergraduate nurses in their second year. They can go in and opens the old debate versus university. I think a tertiary qualification is essential. But how you gain that skill or that experience, that's actually not fixed. We can muck around with that a little bit. So what they've done with this program is introduce second year nurses who now come in and they work in hospitals and they have their rosters and they get paid to do that work rather than flip burgers at McDonald's for two years. So we've got that program happening and I think that's phenomenal. It's brilliant because we still have the university tertiary component. You still have to do the theory, you still have to do the study, but being able to put it to practice, you're doing it before you actually finish your degree, which is awesome. And you're learning on the job from skilled people. And then we've got governments now coming out saying, we're going to waive your hex, which is fantastic. But we're waiting another three years for those people to come through. They're not instant. So hospital design, looking after people, moving to more digital solutions as well will help combat all of these things. But we need to stay patient-centred. Of course we do. But we also need to be staff-centred and we really need to focus on that and do it better. And that will keep people in jobs. It will keep people in the hospital, keep your beds open, keep your operating theatres moving. Yeah, I worked in a hospital once where it had this beautiful outdoor space that the staff loved it, the patients loved it. It was such a busy, popular space. And then the new redevelopment was announced and they said, we'll take that beautiful parkland space right there. Yeah. So, and definitely the mood changed at lunchtime after it was complete because why is this beautiful outdoor space? We could only sit indoors. And I remember going to the cafeteria after it was finished, which was in the basement now, there was very few people in it because everyone wanted to be outside, but there was very few areas to be. And so staff had to walk further and no doubt it impacted some form of patient safety because the staff that were initially only a few meters away were now across the road or at a different park or something like that. And that sense of community and that sense of culture was dispersed. And it was a very visual representation of a lot of staff versus a lot of staff, you know, basement versus outdoor. So I think you're hundred percent right. I think one of the things, like, you know, I worked predominantly in emergency departments. And as we know, you know, you don't have big windows in there because you don't want people seeing in them. You tend to use a lot of borrowed light as opposed to a lot of actual natural light. And the reason the outdoor spaces are really important to me is because 24 hours in, you know, and okay, you don't do 24 hour shift, but say you do a 10 hour shift in the middle of winter in Melbourne. You start in the dark, you finish in the dark, and you spend all your day in artificial light. So it's actually not good for your mental health and it's not good for your physical health. And these are the things that drive me. You need somewhere to go. You need that space. And you're right. They should have protected that space, shouldn't they? It would be good to do a survey of those people, pre and post survey, and see how their mood and how they felt towards the organisation they worked for and if that changed, if there was a shift. Yeah, it's very interesting. Finally, before we go, is there any take-home message that you'd like to give to our listeners, architects, clinicians, and builders alike in reference to human-centered design? Yeah, just, you know, imagine empathy is one of my favorite words at the moment. Put yourself in the shoes of the person going through the experience. How would you like it to be for you? Do you want to be stuck in a basement 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Would you like that? So I think probably, you know, if we could all be a little bit more empathetic, and I know it's become a buzzword, I, I appreciate that but it's so true you know think about how other people move through a building what their day involves and how we can make that better because if we don't look after the staff they won't look after the patients yeah i think that's very true Stuart. i just want to say thank you for your time people like you the clinician that's become a designer with the clinical health background you're a powerful mm-hmm. being and your research and your your projects can certainly see that i've certainly seen some of sdh's projects and worked on them and they're all fantastic it's forward thinkers like you and sdh that really help patients and staff and human-centered design move forward so thank you very much oh thank you david been a pleasure You have been listening to the Australian Health Design Council podcast series, Health Design on the Go. If you would like to learn more about the AHDC, please connect with us on our LinkedIn or website. Thank you for listening.